Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, we're here with your host, Lisa and Venkat. How's it going, Venkat? Hey, Lisa. Happy New Year. Though we already recorded the first supposed 2021 record episode before, right? So this uh, is technically the second 2021 episode, which might air in 2022, depending on that's how right. At the rate we're going, it might be 2022 before it hits the airwaves. But yes, this is but this is our first actually in 2021 um, recording episode. session. So it's uh, just to be located in real time. This is one week after the attempted coup in um, Washington, DC. So that's how we are marking time now. And today is uh, J, the letter J, right? And we are going to be talking about all things joint. So joint, joint. things. Joint. And we're going to start off by each of us is going to like share our brainstormed list of five, three to five things that are joint. So you go first, Lisa. What are yeah, so I've got I've got joint accounts, so that's like uh, and there's oh, just one at a time, right? Joint accounts in the money sense, so you open a joint account with your uh, partner. Okay, um, my first one then will be um, physical bodily joints, like the knee joint or the elbow joint. All right. Uh, my other one was joints, like database joints. Okay. Uh, my next one would be, let's see. Joint as in joint intentions, like when two people want the same thing. Oh, okay. So kind of abstract, but all right. Yeah, and then my third one was like, oh, well, uh, joint Congress, like joint sessions of Congress, which is topical and recent. Okay. <laughs> joint sessions of Congress. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm going to, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to like go more physical while you're trying to go more uh, abstract. Uh, I guess I can't cheat and use mechanical joints twice, but um, okay, uh, glued joints, irreversible glued joints, things that are, you know, attached with super glue and things. Okay, so that's my number three. I don't know if I have numbers four or five, but okay, go I'm ahead. Four. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going, Venkat. All right, um, let's see who wins, four. Joint, joint accounts, except the Twitter version. So like, you know, you got more than one person tweeting from the same Twitter account. Mm, okay. I'm going to go with joint as in uh, military usage. You know, joint services command and the JSTARS aircraft is I think a joint services something. It's an airplane that like manages all the army, air, air force and everything in a uh, war zone. So joint JSTARS aircraft. All right, so that joint in the sense of military. Okay, so we are at four now, five. I think I'm out of things. Okay, so I think we both got to four. All right, so we are talking about things joint. So yeah, which one do you want to start with? I want to start with, uh, let's start with database joints. You had a fun, um, so you had a fun anecdote we were talking right before this episode started about, um, so, if you've been paying attention to the news, there is a it's been a quite a bit of um, stuff on Twitter at least about how Parler, which is a app for it's kind of like Twitter, right? App Parler yeah, so stuff? it's it's Twitter for um, well, I guess um, conservatives and right wing people, and um, yeah. So the reason database joints came up there is uh, what's her name, Sarah May. Uh, she's a so techie on Twitter, she was uh, doing an evaluation of um, how Parler's backend seems to be kind of messed up. And one of the things she kind of mentioned in passing was that to produce something like a stream, a Twitter stream, or any other kind of social media stream, you've got so many fields. You've got like, you know, the user ID, you've got the timestamp, you've got the content, all that stuff. And she <clears throat> guessed that it would take something like nine database joins to produce a stream. So that struck me as kind of an interesting factor because I think the last time I was doing any kind of hands-on techie work, people used to think of like three or four joins as um, kind of big. So nine struck me as like a pretty large join, right? That's expensive. Yeah, it's a, they call it expensiveness, right? And like, I think in terms of, I don't know if the expensiveness is in terms of memory required that has to be loaded before it can get your result. Um, or if it's a time 
it's also, I mean, there's also a time component to it, but I think it might be expensive from a memory standpoint. But don't I mean, those two are in a trade-off, um, right? I mean, you can caching, caching is a way of trading off time versus memory, right? So you can sort of preload a whole bunch of joins and then like save them and then you, you trade off memory for time. Does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think the way I would solve this problem is a little different. Wait, so there's a there's one point about this question before we get to in the weeds about the specifics of how joins work and how to make this problem not as bad. Um, how to, did Sarah May, is this like a speculation, like a theoretical thing or is this oh, actually? Uh, no, there was a bunch of like stuff revealed. I think Twilio cut off Parler for backend services. And as mm -hmm. part of the cutting off, they kind of like listed services or something. And then the whole discussion got started. People hacked Parler. And one of the things that came out was the uh, system administrator of Parler said something like, oh, our records uh, <coughs> ran out at 21 billion, from mm -hmm. which a lot of people guessed that um, they were using a short int as their um, uh, key ID, right? And th this is like way out of my depth on web stuff. So I'm just repeating what I've read on Twitter. But oh, 32 billion once that probably... came out, yeah, people started doing sort of a deep, uh, I don't know, postmortem or analysis of how Parler was set up. And everybody was kind of basically making fun of them for having a really crappy back end. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share the uh, Twitter thread uh, from Sarah May and others. But uh, yeah. yeah, so that's how this came up, the background for this. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's one thing. I mean, it, if, if that's actually what their SQL statements look like, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty bad. There's a way you, so the way you don't do that. And I think for a, hmm. One of the ways that you can avoid having to do that many joins is by instead of having tables, you literally, you have a, you duplicate data in the database such mm -hmm. that, for example, the account name in the record. So in the records that um, you have the tweet data, you also include the field of the account name. And then when you, then you only have to read out of one table and there's no joins. Um, when you update the name, then you'd have to update the entire table, which might be a little more um, intensive. But ideally, the number of times that someone updates their name is a lot less than the number of times that um, that table gets read. Okay. So you, you'd have to like reconcile the different tables only very infrequently because some data changes much faster. But um, backing up a little bit, I think uh, this topic is coming up increasingly because it's an interesting technical question of what happens when a minority group is sort of kicked off a large, extremely high scale platform. And then in theory, you can say that, hey, it's sort of a free country and everybody can kind of like just set up their own uh, platform or something. And I mean, the barrier, to, I mean, it's, it's basically like, I think the question then is like, what should the barrier to entry to certain platforms be for varying groups, right? Um, and I think that Parler has to some extent, I don't wanna say shown, but like gotten to the point where their barrier to entry to running an online service is quite high um, because the amount of capital and know-how and infrastructure that they're going to have to build out on their own, not relying on anyone else is quite, is going to be quite intensive um, because the, because the types of speech that they've been allowing on their platform has resulted in like real world consequences that other businesses have decided they don't want the liability for. Yeah, uh, so the interesting question is like um, the whole idea like of setting aside the philosophical or political aspects of um, freedom of speech or freedom of reach, the technical aspects are interesting because what's really happening is if it was just one person or like a dozen people who wanted like collective freedom of speech, it wouldn't be hard, right? Like anybody could set up a Mastodon server or a WordPress site, which can scale to maybe several dozen or even several hundred people talking at once. But once you start getting into, we want to have like technical enablement of the voice of like a million people or 10 million people, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's no longer clear what the technical means of having sort of shared or joint freedom of speech is, because that's really it. Like if it's just freedom of speech at an individual scale, it kind of doesn't matter. Like all media are available to everybody, go yell or whatever. 
but it's when there's like groups that have group identities or joint identities, and they kind of want to, I don't know, ensure certain rights or their rules of engagement. And then if they get kicked off infrastructure, they kind of have to build their own, right? Like I mean, it's kind of like a, but does it scale question, right? Like this is like the, this is like the, you know, you have a startup and you go into the VCs and they say, okay, this is great, but does it scale? Um, and I like, so basically I guess my thing is like, yeah, you can have like a small, there's a lot of small, dis small distributed platforms that you can build communities on. And once your community reaches a certain size, uh, then you do have to answer the scaling question, right? Like the, yeah. the technical know-how of how to scale a thing is, um, is kind of, a, I think, like, I think Parler is like kind of pointing out the like eliteness of the scaling of scaling capabilities, right? Like yeah. Yeah. if you either you rent and borrow scaling capabilities from companies that have outsourced, have allowed you to purchase it from them, such as AWS, AWS, um, or you have to figure out how to recreate the know-how that knows how to scale on your own. And I think as we're seeing like that is, there aren't like really off the shelf the know-how of how to scale a thing is like not as widespread as you would think. Like this like nine join database query just shows like how naive to some extent, like the the know-how that like, oh, well you just denormalize your database, which is what you do when you start like putting more data than you should in a table um, to help with that problem. Like those sorts of trade-offs and stuff, that's not really, as far as I know, I don't think that sort of know-how is really like, widely known or communicated in schools even like yeah but it's not new if you think about it like scaling only happens when you're thinking of like joint efforts or joint intentions and mm -hmm. if you go back to like pre-digital eras like if you had like say a very esoteric religion and all their people wanted to only live in their own community and not have anybody else around you'd have to build a city right and the know-how of building your own city that you kind of gate and make it like maybe a private land or you know a cult compound like uh, we never start to think about like you know david koresh kind of like cult compounds that sort of retreat from society and build their own sort of uh, living space it's actually not trivial like you have to like i don't know level the ground pave it build your own roads build your own power generation system and if you want to minimize sort of your dependencies on external infrastructure, the more you want to like minimize that, the more you have to know for internal scaling. And then it becomes a question of at what level is it even worth it? Like a city is not worth building if only 10 people want to retreat from the world, right? A city yeah. means minimum like, you know, half a million people maybe have to say, all right, let's go build a city. Then you can hope that in that half a million people, some people will know how to build roads. Some people will know how to like, set up electricity and stuff yeah yeah but i mean it's and this is kind of like this is sort of one of the fun things that i think jane jacobs gets into about cities and scaling and um the know-how of technology is like um she was really she really had this like i think kind of astute observation that know-how and knowing how to build electrical systems and knowing how to build road systems and how these like these different systems kind of interlock with each other and allow you to like build more stuff on top of that. Um, if you, it's possible for like the people or the know-how to get lost, right? And then you live in a place where buildings are made out of bricks, but you no longer know how to remember as a community yep. how to build, how to, how to make bricks. So you can see that it's capable, but you, for whatever reason, as a community can't figure out how to make it happen. Um, that's a society or like a community that's in trouble. Um, yeah. Not saying that like, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, it used to be back in the day, like when Etsy started, I want to say in 2004, 2005, like Etsy, like you ha used to have to do all of the things that Parler is now in theory going to have to do for itself if these, if it can't find a hosting provider. Like the yeah. barrier to entry is a lot higher, but it's not any higher than it has been in the past, so to speak. Um, there's, there's actually, there's more to it if you start thinking about what kinds of people tend to be good at what sorts of things, right? There's a reason that uh, scale things have a liberal bias, whether you're talking about 
large population cities or large sites like Twitter, like take a small software team. You've got a backend person, you've got a UI person, and typically designers have a very different personality than you know backend engineers, and then application developers have a different personality. You know, testing people have a different personality. So even in a small startup team of like three or four people, chances are you'll have like three or four different aesthetics, three or four different like sensibilities of technology. And it only diverges, like the farther up you go, the more, and like, if you get up to a really large city and you want say entertainers, like I was just thinking like all the people who seem to be like, um, I don't know, clutching pearls about uh, freedom of speech on Twitter right now and threatening to leave and not come back and all that. It just struck me that the, this is like a mean thing to say, but on average, I wouldn't miss them because they don't strike me as interesting. Now, I don't mean this as a value judgment of the type of people who are leaving, but I do mean it as something like, there's a reason Hollywood has a liberal bias rather than a conservative bias, because people who are sort of like, I don't know, um, curious and imaginative and want to like uh, write stories about weird shit, they're not likely to be super conservative, old fashioned people sitting in a city. So if your system is large enough that you want storytellers in there telling entertaining stories about like, you know, the future in science fiction or whatever, then chances are you'll end up with Hollywood type people. And on the other extreme, if you want like defense and cops and military, there is a chance that they're gonna be more conservative, right? So the more capabilities you want and you go up from like four people to 400 to 4 million to well, in the case of the US 330 million, you're gonna end up very pluralistic. You're gonna end up with basically, if you wanna do, let's say N things, you might need like something like, uh, I don't know, log n ideologies. Think of it that way, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a uh, hundred things or hundred function functional skills you want, then log of hundred is two. So you need like at least two ideologies. If you go to thousand, maybe you need three. So that's I that, mean, that, okay. But, but Benkhead, I feel like you've also just described the two syndromes that Jane Jacobs laid out in terms okay. of like the guardian versus commercial syndromes to a certain extent, like value yeah. systems. Maybe it's uh, certainly in the US, even if you go all the way to the top, the divide is mainly two, right? Uh, but it's not entirely like two is like the minimum number of partitions you can make. But look at, we were talking about joint sessions of Congress, right? That's actually four groups, if you think about it. There's Senate and then there's House of Representatives and they're like derived from the British House of Lords and House of Commons, right? So you've got the commoners and then senators tend to be older, kind of like richer people more connections and within both yeah, those maybe. you have right and left so right left nobles and commoners so already you've got like four different worldviews that it takes to run a society like you know vertical division and horizontal division and to run a successful house of um, or sorry joint session of uh, legislative body you need those four groups kind of like harmoniously talking and what happened last week was they one side decided to bring a riot mob in there. So, yeah, it's actually as someone posted, I think I retweeted an interesting thing. Uh, I don't think it was during the joint session. It was during they had recessed. I believe it was a house speech. One of the representatives from Pennsylvania was talking. They were, I think, they were discussing objections to the Pennsylvania electoral votes. And one of the Pennsylvanian representatives got up and stood up to defend the process that Pennsylvania had put in place and explained um, what they had done. And at some point um, pointed out, or I think accused the side that had raised the objections of lying um, and not being completely honest about their the basis of their objections and the like factual basis mm -hmm. of the stuff that they were bringing up. And, um, the the tweet that contextualized the video was like it's interesting because you notice at some point like this the people get up out of their seats like they're gonna go fight each other um yep. and it's not like the point at which your representatives and like aren't just doing debate but are actually like about to get into physical altercations like the that point i don't know there, and that happens. Like I think that's, um, well, there's lots of examples of that happening in developing countries where people just go at each other. And even in the US, um, historically, that has happened, like people just yeah. getting into like punching each other. 
Yeah, wasn't that like Henry Clay like beating Kane, not to death, but like Kane down the floor of the Senate kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So that sort of thing has happened in the past and I can see it happening again if this sort of thing continues, right? And, And it brings up an interesting point that, I mean, if you don't have trust, then there is no way you're ever going to agree on facts because you and I will sort of pick different contexts for facts and then we'll kind of like keep picking away at each other's context. Mm -hmm. So if you have a certain amount of trust, then you can say, all right, on this basis, I'll give, I'll see that point to you, you see this point. So that kind of like compromise and give and take, I think that's sort of central to the idea of like joint anything. And that's actually a good segue point for like joints in the mechanical sense, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you have two physical uh, rigid bodies, like I don't know, this uh, phone and this pen, they each have six degrees of freedom. They're like three translation and three rotational. And if you attach them with a join, then well, each of them is going to reduce one of the three uh, degrees of freedom, right? And that's kind of how you do analysis of like mechanical designs. Um, if you hear in the background, the 3D printer is going, I'm actually printing my prototype Mars rover. And I was just thinking about like, how do like make its joints work? And I just realized um, like last week that one of the joints that I thought was an axle joint. So like, you know, uh, a wheel inside an axle kind of joint. It's actually a ball joint. It has like uh, no freedom. And now that's completely messed up my design because now I have to redesign that joint much better to be a ball joint instead of a uh, axle joint. And I think uh, if you go to one extreme and you take glued joints, like just, you know, super glue two things together, that's like the strongest kind of like joint mutual constraining because now you've like completely constrained each other and the six degrees of freedom that each has, so six plus six, 12, it comes down to six because you've like completely fixed one to the other. And the other two don't constrain each other at all. And I think humans are like that um, as well. Like you and I are talking right now and we kind of have to come up with like a joint interruption protocol. Like we can't both speak at the same time without it turning into noise. So we've constrained one degree of freedom in time. Like when I stop talking, you can start talking, so yeah. (laughs) um yeah so managed to connect mechanical joints and constraints to human ones yeah yeah let's talk about the bitcoin one the joint accounts and multi-sig accounts yeah yeah we didn't really talk about that it's like joint accounts right because crypto has kind of has its own form of joint accounts um which are in the form of multi-sig um account management stuff um they're interesting because they allow more than one person to have to sign off on any usage of the funds right Um, it's kind of fun it's like a literal you literally sign off you literally append your signature to a transaction that shows that you approve of the thing which is kind of fun and it technically won't work unless it has enough signatures, which I think is so cool, man. <laughs> like the thing about cryptocurrency stuff that's just so incredible to me is that it like technically constrains all of these like norms that we've had before. Like, so in the past you would like, let's say you have a joint account with like you and your wife, for example, like a joint checking account. Um, in theory, that grants either of you permission to do anything you want with the funds, right? So it's basically like saying there's two people and they each have a key. Um, so we can change, oh, we can like, we can define this in terms of multi sig So like most joint accounts, when you say a joint account, you mean that there's two people or two SIGs, two different keys that are allowed to do anything with it, but you only need one signature from them, right? Uh-huh. So it's a one of two. So there's two people that are authorized to move money from this account and you only need one of them to do it in order to move it, right? Um, so that's a one of two um, multi-sig example. But as like crypto that. is mostly something like a majority rule or consensus two of two or two of three or something like that, right? That's yeah, that, Norman crypto. Crypto makes it such that the contract is easy. Like the, it's very, very easy um, to turn that into a two of two on a, a Bitcoin transaction such that any move, and that basically means that any movement in that account requires a signature from both parties that are party to that account, um, which is so cool. It's so cool. Um, so you can create the typical joint account checking thing by having a one of two. So either transaction can spend the money or you can enforce it that two of two 
Um, or you could make it two of three and say, here's three different parties that are eligible yep. to sign for this transaction and any two of them can decide to move the money and agree on it. And then that's a valid uh, transaction. But all this is like uh, built our into- Our friend the Joe Kelly like, you know, uh, who have mentioned the unchanged capital, they have like a two of three account. And one of the interesting things they do is in case one person dies, um, you don't want the account locked out. So they offer to hold the third key. So it kind of creates interesting sort of trust scenarios like that. Like normally if a, if a couple has an account together, it would yeah. be a two of three account, but both would be alive and signing and like doing normal things. And in an exceptional case, the sort of third party would kick in and unlock the account, right? Yeah, I mean, but that also creates the opportunity for collusion, right? Like if you and your wife get into a fight over custody and the wife is able to coerce or convince Unchained Capital to sign a transaction that then delegates all the money to a new address that only he or she controls. Um, yeah. And that's like also another vector of whatever. So I think it really, yeah, I mean. it's That one's interesting because the way I think Unchained offers its terms of service is obviously on the death of one account holder, the other person will help the other one. So one mm -hmm. way you can imagine this working is um, faking the death of a spouse or like so a spouse vanishes and doesn't come back for seven years and then you have them declared dead, right? And that's a plot element in lots of old fashioned stories as well. Like it's just a crypto version. But yeah. um, let me ask you a question. What's the, like in the pre-crypto era, it's the scaling. So we are back to actually talking about scaling, right? Mm -hmm. Scaling joint accounts is really hard and joint sessions of parliament, for example, are like really, the equivalent of joint accounts of, um, what is it, 500 odd representatives and 100 senators. So like 600 plus people have a joint account over the fate of the United States. And it takes certain like, you know, signature rules to pass legislation, right? So that's like constitutional amendment is a multi-sig uh, protocol involved. Multi -sig, yes. Yeah, two third or something, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, do you know of like crypto scaling to like bigger than that? Like what's the largest multi-sig wallet that you know of? Like are there wallets that require a million signatures? Okay, I don't know the specifics of this, but I know I, I know a concrete example of running into the limitations on the number of parties that are permissible to a multi-sig. And it has to do with, I don't know what this is, whatever. It has to do with Liquid, the, block, the blockchain that um, Blockstream, uh, created and maintains. Um, my understanding is that there's a maximum number of 15 and that that is a, that I thought that that was due to, I don't know why that is, but I think that there was a technical limit that was like 15. You could have 15 signatories to a, any one contract. So that um, seems kind of arbitrary. I would think you would want to like make that unlimited because that's one of the strengths of crypto. You don't have like and people having to physically sign something, right? So you can no, have- but The thing, multi-sig contracts are expensive um, because uh, at least in Bitcoin, which is what the thing that I know the best, um, for any for any any signature, so it has it's expensive in terms of fees that you pay to get that transaction mined. Oh, so God. any signature, every additional signature that gets added to a transaction is about 90 extra bytes. Um, which is a lot. The signature data tends to dominate the um, the uh. expense of spending a multi-sig and multi-sigs by nature have multiple signatures on them. I believe that, so there's this new proposal called Taproot, uh, which is, oh, a Schnorr. Sure, Taproot, one of those. Um, the nice thing about, okay, so Bitcoin is like, there's been this proposal that's been out for a long time. I think that's marching its way slowly into being part of the Bitcoin protocol um, that involves a new signature protocol called Schnorr. Uh, Schnorr allows you to do signature ag aggregation, which means that instead of having 10 signatures, you can kind of collapse them all together into a single signature, and then it'll validate the same as the 10 separate ones, um, which is great, say, space savings. Um, so in theory, this will, in theory, I say in theory, because I think they're still working on the multi-sig protocol for it is quite complicated for reasons and is new crypto. So that's also slightly deep. Like there's like a lot of open questions around that. Um, but 
anyway, so like multi-sig under Schnorr is still like, I don't, I don't want to call it an open question because I know that there are like definitely proposals on how to do it. Um, but I think they're a good deal more complicated than existing multi-sig stuff. Anyways, there's like, anyways, like uh, so this, this like expensiveness of multi-sig is going to go away at some point. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a practical constraint in that you can do all these aggregation and cascading and delegation yeah. and various ways around it. So, uh, but it does seem kind of fascinating that uh, in theory now you could have like really powerful kinds of direct democracy, right? Like, um, yeah. like, a, that, isn't this like the whole, this is more of an Ethereum thing than a Bitcoin thing, right? So Bitcoin is all about joint accounts on the money side, right? Like who's authorized to spend yeah. and move money. Um, like the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, right? That I think is a lot yeah, more. Yeah, those the... guys are doing a lot of very weird things around this stuff. Like, um, yeah. yeah, though, and they keep, uh, there's one called Colony that I was working with for a while. Uh, so they're, they're kind of interesting, but I think so far nobody has really shown that that kind of governance mechanism works on anything other than the crypto projects themselves that are trying to make it happen, right? So there's, you would like it to work for a real case, not just like a test case that's your own project. So um, I'm still a little skeptical that they're like getting the sociology of it wrong, but technically there's no good reason it can't happen. At the, anyway, so how are we doing on time? Are we on? I think we're about out of time. Oh, okay. All right. So that was our episode on all things joint. All things joint. Over joint right. round. Um, Cool. All right. So that's the J episode. I guess we'll see you next time for what comes after J. K? K. Yes. K. Oh, we should be able to think of some good stuff for K. I think we're going to kill it next episode. I can feel <laughs> it. Um. All right. Nice talking to you as usual, Lisa. <laughs> All right. Always a pleasure being Kat. I'll see you later. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>